to Hebrews chapter 10, Hebrews chapter 10, and uh, I'm going to look at an interesting message. We are living in a day and age when people are changing, and not always for the best, and one of the things that concerns me, as concerns a lot, is there's people that used to stand strong for the fundamentals of the faith. They used to st stand strong for the word of God, and, and now they don't. It's amazing how many people are are now getting involved in things that at one time they preached against. And uh, so what I want to do is I want to preach a message tonight entitled, Fasten Your Grip. And the idea of it is this, we need to get a hold of some truth and we need to hold on and not give up. And so Hebrews chapter 10, uh, stay, stand if you would, we'll start in verse number 22. Hebrews chapter 10 and uh, let's see, uh, okay, Hebrews 10 verse 22. Uh, let's see. Okay, let, uh, that may not be what we need. Okay, might be Hebrews 12. Let me look here. Sorry about that. It's going to be one of those nights. Okay. Okay, well, we'll just go to Hebrews chapter 10 and uh, verse 25. Okay, go to verse Hebrews chapter 10, verse 23. There we go. That's where we're at, okay? It says, let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful, that promise. Uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Lord, we come to you tonight, and Lord, uh, it's been sort of a uh, mixed up start here to the message, but Lord, I pray that you would just uh, calm my spirit, calm my mind, and Lord, help me to focus now on the message we have tonight. Lord, I pray that you would touch our hearts uh, Lord, we need Christians that are going to stand in this day and age. Lord, the world's doing everything it can to drive Christianity out of society, trying to drive Christianity back into the closet or into the closet, and uh, Lord, trying to shut up the message and to stop us from taking a stand. But Lord, I pray that tonight, Lord, you would give us a holy zeal. Lord, give us a desire to stand as we ought to stand. Lord, bless us as we look at these principles that are taught in your word. Lord, I pray that you would use them to, uh, to create in us a desire to serve you better than we've ever served you before. Now, Lord, we ask that you would open up our eyes, help us to behold wondrous things out of your law. And in Jesus' name we pray, amen. You may be seated. The Bible tells us, having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh, and having an high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful, that promise. Let us consider one another to provoke unto love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as a manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. In the book of Hebrews, the, there's a, a two-word phrase that stands out uh, quite a bit, and that is the phrase, let us. Uh, it is used in our text. It denotes a combined effort between the writer and the people to whom he is writing. Uh, there is a message I have not preached in a, a, quite a while, but a message entitled, Let Us Christians. Let Us Christians. Twelve times in the book of Hebrews you find the phrase, let us. Tonight I want us to use just one or focus on one and, and use that as our key thought. Uh, the thought of the message came from originally uh, Charles Spurgeon's message that I read, but he got it from uh, the writings of Samuel Rutherford, and he got it from the Word of God. And so the one thing I realize is this, if you're going to preach the truth, you're not going to preach an original message. It all goes back to the Word of God. But the thought of the message came from one of his messages, but both Rutherford and Spurgeon put it this way, I pray you to fasten your grips. Fasten your grips. From that thought, Charles Spurgeon listed six things on which we need to fasten our grips or fasten our hold on. Six things on which we need to get a better and stronger hold. And so tonight, what I want us to do is consider this thought from both his perspective as well as mine. We're going to look at some things, some, some terms that the Lord uses to get across the idea of fastening your grip. 
In other words, there's some things that we need to get a hold of and we need to hold on with all our mind. The world, like I said earlier, is trying to get us to change. The world's trying to get us to change the message that we have. The world's trying to get us to change our demeanor. The world doesn't like someone that stands strong in their faith. And so we're going to look at some things and some principles of fastening our grip. The first is found in 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse number 13. It says, Hold fast the form of sound words which thou hast heard of me in faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. So the first term I want to look at is that term, hold fast. We are to hold fast. That means to hold such as a possession. It means to have in the hand, in the sense of wearing, to have possession of the mind, to hold fast, to keep, to, to uh, have, to comprise or involve. And so basically what it's talking about is there's something on which we need to grasp in our possession. You might say that we are, we, uh, that they are our holdings, our possession granted us in Jesus Christ. And, and so basically what we're looking at, there are some things that we have been given in Christ that are ours by inheritance. There's things that God has given us that are ours by right of salvation. Uh, these are things of the kingdom of God. As we read into the word of God, you're going to find there's some things that the Bible tells us that ought to be a part of our life. Uh, Jesus came preaching the kingdom of God. John the Baptist came preaching the kingdom of God, came preaching repentance. These are things that are our spiritual birthright, the doctrines of the word of God. There is an attack today against the sound words of God. There's an attack against the sound teachings of the word of God that we used to have years ago, but today they're being let go. There's a thing out here uh, out now called reform fundamentalism that's going on. And it's the idea of letting go of where we used to stand and accepting a new and a better way of standing. Uh, our doctrines are under attack. But as I look into the word of God, I realize that there are some things that God has given us and he wants us to have as the children of God. And one of the things the Bible tells us to do is hold fast the form of sound words. We need to hold on to it. We need to look at it. This is ours. We're not going to let it go. Our relationship with God, that which is granted us by way of adoption, the closeness which comes by way of salvation and surrender, the Christian life, which is that new life that we have in Christ. And so the first thing we want to look at is this. We need to hold on to it and say, you know what? This is mine. I'm not going to let it go. Our understanding of the holiness of God is under attack. Ezekiel 22, verse 26, her priests have violated my law and have profaned my holy things. They have put no difference between the holy and the profane, neither have they showed difference between the unclean and the clean, and have hid their eyes from my Sabbaths and am profaned, and I am profaned among them. One of the things that, that God gave to Ezekiel, one of the messages he gave is this. He said the priest... I mean, God's priests, they are violating the law of God. They are not showing a difference between the profane and, and, the, and the holy. Uh, one of the things they were supposed to do is they were supposed to show them these things belong to God. They don't change. But what they started doing is they started mixing the world in with the things of God. And they actually profaned the things of God. We find today that there's people that, whose, whose idea is that, you know, the things that used to be preached against, they are now doing, and they're saying, well, that's legalism, and we're not, you know, we're, we're free in Christ, and we're under grace, and we're not under the law. And so what we find today is that there is a type of Christianity out there that, that is nothing compared at all to the way it used to be. It used to be we had preachers that preached standards. It used to be we had preachers that expected holiness. And, and that's where we used to stand. We, we believed that, that living for God is different than living for the world. But one of the things we find today is we find there's a lot of things that are under the name of Christian that doesn't even look like what Christianity used to look like. And one of the things that God wants us to do is to hold fast. That means this is what's ours and we hold it fast. We don't let it go. There's a second term that we're going to look at, and that's in 1 Timothy 6, verse number 12. It says, fight the good fight of faith, lay hold on eternal life, for unto thou art also called, and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. The second phrase, the first phrase is, 
is hold fast. The second phrase is laying hold. Now that's, that term means to seize for help or injure, or, or to seize for help or attainment. Uh, the way to liken it, it's like a man drowning in a river when he seizes hold on the end of the rope that was tossed to him from the boat nearby. Uh, it's like a drowning man who grasps the neck of a nearby person, pulling them down into the water. And the only way that that lifeguard can save them is to knock them unconscious because that man's got a hold of them and he's not going to let go and he's going to hold on to them because he's holding on for his life. Mm -hmm. I remember when I was in Scouts, uh, they took us down to Crawfordsville to the pool. And, uh, and uh, their idea of teaching you how to swim is you stay, they have you stand by the deep end and they come in behind you when you don't realize it and they push you into the deep end. And that's their way. Uh, well, that was their way of drowning uh, one of their instructors because they pushed me in. It happened one of the scout leaders was right next to me. I grabbed a hold of him. I was up on his shoulders. I was drowning him while I was drowning. And they had to pry my hands off of him. Well, that's what the Bible tells us here. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life. Understand, as long as there is life, this man was not going to let go. And, and so, you know, we are to lay hold or to seize for help on eternal life. We need to get a hold of the Lord, and we need to hold on to him for all we're worth. Because that's where our help comes. Luke chapter 11, verse 5, and he said unto them, Which of you shall have a friend, and shall go unto him at midnight, and say unto him, Friend, lend me three, lend me three loaves. For a friend of mine in his journey has come to me, and I have nothing to set before him. And he from within shall answer and say, Trouble me not, the door is now shut, and my children are with me in bed. I cannot rise and give thee. I say unto you, though he will not rise and give him because he is his friend, yet because of his importunity, he will rise and give hold as, or give as many as he needeth. I say unto you, ask and it shall be given you, seek and ye shall find, knock and it shall be opened unto you, for every one that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth, and to him that knocketh it shall be opened. The illustration here is of a man coming to his friend. This man had, a, uh, had company come. He has nothing to give them. Right. Uh, his company's hungry. He goes to his friend. It's late at night. He knocks on the door and he says, hey, a friend of mine is coming his journey and he's hungry and I don't have anything to give him. Lend me three loaves. And the guy says, hey, I'm already in bed. My kids are in bed. It's midnight. It's time to go to sleep. And you know what his friend does? Hey, I need three loaves of bread. I need three loaves of bread. I need three loaves of bread. And finally the guy gets up and gives him the bread, not because he's his friend, but because he won't shut up and leave. <laughs> Bible says in Luke 18, verse 5, Yet because of this widow troubleth me, I will avenge her, lest by her continuing coming she weary me. One of the things the Lord wants us to do is to seize a hold of what he's given us and hold on to it with all your mind because there's nothing when you don't. So we see we're to hold fast. We see number two, uh, that we are to lay hold. We are to hold on to, we are to seize on. Uh, and, and then the third one is Revelation 3 verse 11. It says, behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast which thou hast that no man take thy crown. The third phrase is hold that fast. What that means is to use all the strength that you have. It means to seize uh, and retain, to retain. It means to have power, be powerful, to be chief, to be master of, to rule, to get possession of. A great example of that is two kids fighting over a piece of candy. And one's got a hold of it and the other's got a hold of it and neither of them are letting go of it. Uh, I remember when I was a kid, we used to play murder ball. Anybody play murder ball? Anybody know what murder ball is? We played it. It was a great game. What it is, uh, you had one person with it. It was a dodgeball. You had one person with the dodgeball, and the idea was everybody else was trying to get the ball away from them. And, and you could do anything you wanted to get the ball away from them. And for some reason, I was dumb enough to hold on to the ball. <laughs> you know, I mean, they're doing everything they can to get it away from you so that they could get it and everybody could attack them. And the idea was to see when the time was up, uh, you know, we had a time limit whenever the bell went off or the whistle went off, whoever had the ball was a winner. 
And, and you would hold on to that ball and you're not letting it go because you know what? I'm going to win this thing. I'm going to hold on to this thing. Well, that's what it means to hold that fast. What it means is you've got a hold of it. You're going to put all your strength into it. You're not going to let go. You're going to fight everything that you have, everyone you have to fight. You're going to give it all that you have because when that whistle blows, you want to be the one with the ball. It means putting yourself into it with all that you have to give. And so one is looking at it and saying, this is mine, I'm going to hold on to it. Another one says, you know what, I'm going to give all my strength. The third phrase is found in 2 Samuel 23, or no, in Genesis 32, verse 24 through 26. And Jacob was left alone, and there wrestled a man with him until the breaking of day. When he saw that he had prevailed not against him, he touched the hollow of his thigh, and the hollow of Jacob's thigh was out of joint as he wrestled with him. And he said, let me go, for the day breaketh. And he said, I will not let thee go, except thou bless me. Jacob was intent, or Jacob had intended, or Jacob determined that he would not let go of God until God blessed him. I believe the man that Jacob was fighting or wrestling with was an Old Testament appearance of Christ. And he said, let me go. And he said, I will not let thee go except thou bless me. The only thing that would save he and his family was the divine interaction with God. He knew that the next day Esau was coming. Esau had an army with him and, and Jacob had his servants and had his family and, and, and Esau had already sworn to kill Jacob and, and, and it's the night before. He's got everything set up. I mean, he's hoping to buy off Esau to appease his anger. He doesn't know that God had already done that, but he knew this, that he had to have the blessings of God or he would not survive. And as the morning rose, uh, the Lord said, let me go for the day breaketh. And he said, I will not let thee go except thou bless me. You know, Jacob was not letting the angel of the Lord go until he received what he needed. Oh, for husbands and wives and parents who would wrestle with God till the blessings are granted. But it's the same idea. I'm not going to let you go. A, th a fifth one is found in 2 Samuel 23, verse 9. And after him was Eliezer, the son of Dodo, a, a, a Holite, uh, one of the three mighty men of, with David, when they defied the Philistines that were gathered together to battle, and the men of Israel were gone away, he arose and smote the Philistines until his hand was weary and his hand clave unto the sword. And the Lord wrought a great victory that day, and the people returned after him only to spoil. His hand clave unto the sword. Now, some people, uh, the word clave means to cling, to adhere, to keep fast. Now, some scholars believe that what it was, he, he was fighting the enemy so much, and the blood, as it would come off the sword down onto his <laughs> hand, it, it would gel, and his hand was stuck to the weapon because of the blood. I think what he was talking about is he held so tight to that sword that, that when the battle was over with, he could not open up his hand. Have you ever worked so hard? I mean, I remember working with a brick mason and, and after about a week with a brick mason, when the weekend came, my hands were like this. I had to pry them open like that because I held so tight and everything carrying the block and all of that and the wheelbarrows that, that my hands just sort of froze in that position. But the idea is this, he didn't let go. Right. He didn't let go. Now I look at all of this and I realize in each of these cases, in all five of these cases, what you have is you have somebody that's holding on to something with all his might, putting all his strength into it, is not going to let go. He's determined not to let go and he's not going to let go until he receives from God that which he needs. Now that's the mindset that we need. In this day and age that we live, we need Christians that are going to get a hold of the truths of God, get a, get a hold of the doctrines of God, get a hold of the standards of God, and not let go, no matter what the world puts that pushes their way. Mm -hmm. Now, there's a purpose for this, and that's what I want to look at also. Why do we need to hold on to things? Well, number one, there's the danger of Satan coming along and taking away what is ours. Right. 
The Bible says in Matthew 13, verses 3, 3 and 4, And he spake many things unto them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went forth to sow. And when he sowed, some seed fell by the wayside, and the fowls came and devoured them up. Matthew 13, verse 19, it says, And when one heareth the word of the kingdom, or the word of the kingdom and understandeth it not, then cometh the wicked one and catcheth away that which was sown in his heart. Mm -hmm. This is he that receives seed by the wayside. The danger of what we have being taken away, caught away from us. You know, there's a danger of Satan coming and trying to take from us what God has given us. Yeah. And we need to understand that that's a daily battle. If Satan could convince us to change our doctrine, mm -hmm. if Satan could convince us to change our lifestyle. Listen, when a person gets saved, uh, then life begins to work. Uh, the Lord comes and brings the daily load of blessings and benefits. But often what will happen is Satan comes right after that and tries to catch away the blessings of God yeah. mm -hmm. and tries to take away from us that which God has for us. And we need to understand we are in a satanic battle. Mm -hmm. And we are facing the enemy every day and, and there's pressure on us to give in, if we'll just give in a little bit or if we get in over here and, and sort of let up a little bit and let up on our standards and let up on the message and let up on our, our views of God, if we'll just sort of let up on our witnessing and, 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 and keep it quiet like the world's telling us, then what Satan will do is he'll come away and he'll snatch everything that God's given us. Amen. But you know what? That's why we got to hold on. Amen. we got to look at it and say, Satan, you can't have what God's given me. I'm not going to give you my family. I'm not going to give you my church. I'm not going to give you my holiness. But Satan will come and catch it away. And then there's the danger of it being spoiled. Now, I'm not talking about rotting in the refrigerator. What I'm talking about, it becomes the spoils of war. The Bible says in Matthew 12, verse 29, or else how can one enter into a strong man's house and spoil his goods except he first bind the strong man, and then he will spoil his house. Right. I look at that, and really what Satan's trying to do is this. He's trying to bind us so that all the things that God gives us becomes the spoils of war. Now, what's the spoils of war? That's what the victor takes home with him. Right. Children of Israel would go out and they would fight the enemy. And when the battle was over with, all the, the things that were left on the battlefield, they went, in, they went in at times and they drove away the Philistines and they came back and they spoiled the camp. They came and took the clothes and the riches and the weapons and all of that. That became the spoils of war. The spoils of war go to the victor. This is when Satan comes into your life and takes what God has given you. He spoils you. He takes your family. He takes your possessions. He takes your mind. But to do this, he must bind you first. Then he can have what he wills. He can take from you. This is when Christians, uh, when a Christian is defeated and surrender and gives up. How many times have we seen uh, somebody serving the Lord and then Satan comes along and he gets the victory and you look at it and you see the home fall apart. You see the testimony fall apart. You see the church fall apart. You see the life fall apart. And you look at someone that one time had victory, one time was serving God, one time was being strong, and you look at him and you see all of it gone because it became the spoils of war. And so we, we want to watch out. We want to watch out about the, the danger of being caught away, being snatched from us, the danger of being turned into the spoils of war. Number three, the danger of slipping away. Hebrews 2 verse 1, Therefore we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. That term, let them slip, means to flow by, to carelessly pass away. You know, there is a danger of drifting away. There is a danger of gradually losing our stand. You know, most of the time, we're not going to have a sudden defeat. Right. Most of the time, we're not going to lose what we have all at one time. Mm -hmm. You know, fundamentalism is being lost with a little slipping at a time. 
just letting in a little here, and giving up a little here, and surrendering a little here. Listen, you don't have to do anything to have things slip out of your grasp. I mean, how many times have we, we, we stood strong, but then we, we just started sort of resting on our laurels? We're at ease in Zion. And then the next thing we know, we don't know how it happened, but the next thing we know where we used to stand here, we're now over here. And then we just sort of uh, get tired and we drift a little bit here and we drift a little bit here and we drift a little bit here. And, and after a while we look over here and we think, how did I get from there over to here? How did I get from being a strong Christian loving God to being a Christian that barely reads my Bible and barely prays and, and, and has no spiritual victory? I remember years ago I, uh, when I pastored there on the coast, I had one of the young men in our church that was a surfer. He loved to go surfing. And he decided to take me surfing with him. He had two surfboards. And so I'm out there on the water and, and I was uh, heavy at that time. Maybe not quite as heavy as I got up in Michigan. But you know what? Uh, you ought to see me on a surfboard. I wish I could have been on the surfboard. But, but he could stand up on the surfboard and ride the waves. And, and, and me, I could lay on the surfboard. I couldn't, I couldn't even kneel on the surfboard. But we were out there, and what you would do is you would paddle out to where you, the breakers would, you would just be on the breakers. And then as a swell is coming in, you would paddle with your arms and, and your hands and, and get up on that swell, and then it would turn into a wave and you would ride it in. Well, we got out there on the water and were, and, and were waiting for the swells to come, and then we noticed that the swells were up ahead of us. And there was a, a pier, uh, the Carolina Beach Pier, and, and the, the end of the Carolina Beach Pier used to be here. But then we noticed that the end of the Carolina Beach Pier was there. What had happened is we started drifting further out. And we had to swim back in to get up to where the swells were. Well, you know what? That's exactly what happens. Our Christianity starts to slip. It starts to give in a little bit. You know, we, we, we don't mean to go all the way, but we just give in a little at a time and a little at a time and a little at a time. And then somewhere, hopefully, we, we stop and we realize, you know what, I'm not where I used to be. I need to get back. There's a danger of wasting away because of not being used in appropriate times. Matthew 6, verses 19 through 20. Let us uh, let, uh, lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through or steal. You know, here's one who, hold, who holds on to what he has, but it rusts away with disuse and misuse. You know, God's given us a lot. You know, God's given us the plan of salvation. Amen. But have you ever noticed that if you don't use it after a while, you get rusty at it? Have you ever noticed that, that you know, you used to be able to quote all the verses in the Romans Road? Mm -hmm. Used to know all the plans, and, 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 and then at, but, but after a while, you, you got to thinking, and you're now trying to witness to somebody, and you realize that, what was that verse? And it's not so much old age as it's just you've not used it in a while. A lot of times our Bible studies that way. You know, God gives us all these things to be used and all these tools that we have and, 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 and it's sort of like food molding in the refrigerator. It's sort of like with something we've set aside and now the freshness date is passed. Understand, God gives us what we need for today, to use for today. He gives us the times and the opportunities and the service given to us by God. But a lot of times what happens, the thing that God has given us, we've held on to it, we've not used it, and now it's gotten old. Now it's gotten rusty. Now we've got to get refreshed again. The Bible says now you need, have need of being taught again mm -hmm. because we've not used it. So the danger of it wasting away and then the danger of dying away. 
Luke 12, verse 16, And he spake a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do? Because I have no room to bestow my fruits. Uh, and he said, This will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater. Uh, there will I bestow all my, food, all my fruits and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said unto him, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then who shall those things be which thou hast provided? You know, when death comes, we will lose all that we have except that which we put in heaven. We'll lose our opportunities. You know, we may lay pretty flowers or trinkets or even a Bible in the cold, dead hands in the casket, but it won't do them any good. You know, uh, dead hands may have once held the hand of a little child, held the books for a favored, or held the books for a favored girl, held the arm of an adoring lover, held the bundle, uh, held the bundle of parents' joy, held the future of a struggling students, held the body of a sickening child, held the hope of a sin sick people, but they hold nothing anymore. They're dead. They're dead. Someday we're going to be gone, and everything that God gave us to use for Him Amen. will be of no avail. The purpose of fastening the grip is to get a hold and not let go. Satan cannot catch it, cannot spoil it. I will not waste it. I will not let it slip. The only way anyone will get from us what God has given us is by prying it from our cold, dead hands. That's the illustration. It's the idea, okay, you know what we're saying? We're, we're independent, fundamental Baptists. Okay, understand, I mean, we, we have the way of salvation. We, we have the, the doctrines of holiness. We have the doctrines in the word of God. We have all these things that God has given us. But we need to understand Satan's going to do everything he can to get it from us. And so there are some things that we need to get a hold of. And I want to just present a few to you at the, at the end of this message. What are some things that we need to hold, get a hold of that we don't need to let go? We need to realize that Satan's trying to get it from us and the world's trying to get it from us. And, and the truth is our backslidden heart's trying to get rid of it. But what are some things that we need to, to tighten our grip on? Well, number one, we need to fasten. You need to fasten your grip with regards to Jesus Christ. Amen. I mean, we need to understand he is our Savior. He is the Son of God. We live in a day where they're trying to do away with him and they're trying to weaken the doctrines on him. And, and for, cent or for decades now, and, and maybe even centuries, they've tried to declare him not to be the Son of God, but he is. He's God in the flesh. But John 6, verse 66, says, From that time many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. Then said Jesus unto the twelve, Will ye also go away? <laughs> then, Simon Peter, or then Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of life, and we believe and are sure that thou art that Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered them, Have not I chosen you twelve, and one of you is a devil? He spake of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, for he it was that should betray him, being one of the twelve. You know, we need to get a hold of, we need to get a firm grip on our relationship with Jesus Christ. Amen. And not let Satan snatch it away. Right. Not let him spoil it by distractions. I mean, you know, we have so many people, they, they, they're they saved, they, they claim to be saved, but you know what, their, their hold on the Lord is mighty, mighty weak. Now, I'm glad that I'm not saved because of my hold on the Lord. His hold on me saves me. Amen. But understand, how easy is it for us to lose our relationship with God? I mean, we become cold. We become indifferent. We don't see him as we used to see him. He was our savior. He's, a, he's the one that, that we trust. He's the one that we lean on. But see, what happens today is people lose their hold on Jesus. You look at people today, I mean, at one time, they used to be Sunday school teachers. Uh -huh. At one time, they used to be preachers. 
At one time, they used to be faithful. One time, they used to be soul winners. At one time, they would speak of the Lord and have tears in their eyes. At one time, they would look at him and realize how dear and how special he is. But now, their heart is cold. And now, their eyes are dry. And now, they have no passion for the Lord. They have no desire for the Lord. Matter of fact, they don't even think about the Lord most of the time. They lost their grip. They lost their grip. Let me say, if you have a relationship with God, you do everything you can to keep that relationship near and dear. Amen. Another reason, we, another thing we need to do is fasten your grip on the doctrines of the gospel and the revealed truths of the word of God. 1 Corinthians 2, verse 2, For I determined not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ and him crucified. One of the things missing today are the scholars of the word of God. People don't know their Bibles. Now, I'm not talking about PhDs. Yeah. You know, I'm not talking about doctors of philosophy. What I'm talking about are the moms and dads and the Sunday school teachers that used to know the Bible. Right. Just the Christians that used to know the Bible. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I mean, you know, uh, we, we had uh, parents, uh, we have, have people, uh, our, our ancestors, our forefathers, who knew more about their Bible than the doctors of divinity know today. You know, all that we are is in what we know to be true based on the word of God. Take away our doctrine and you change what we are. And today we have a generation that says, well, you know, doctrine's not important. I remember, I remember back several years ago, they had promise keepers. And I don't know if you remember the promise keepers that was going on. And it was a big movement. And, and it was a movement among the men to teach them to keep their promises. And I remember one of the things that they said that made it so dangerous is they said, you know, we need to get rid of our doctrinal differences yeah. and bring everybody together under one umbrella. Well, I'll tell you what, I don't <laughs> mind but belonging under one umbrella as long as that umbrella is the word of God. Yeah. But it does matter how you believe you're saved. Yes. It does matter whether you believe you're saved by grace or you're saved by being good enough. Yes. It does matter what the word of God teaches. And one of the things we need to do is we need to fasten our grip on the doctrines of the gospel and the revealed truths of the word of God. Listen, it does matter what the Bible teaches. You change what it teaches and you change the word of God. Yes. And then we need to fasten our grip on the promises of God. You know, our very nature is dependent upon the promises of God. Second Peter chapter 1, verse 3, According as his divine power hath given unto us all that pertain unto life and godliness, through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these you might be partakers, get this, of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through us. The promises of God keeps us from going into the midst of, or keeps us going in the midst of persecution and affliction. The promises of God helps erase the doubt that Satan throws our way. When Satan comes along and says, yea, hath God said, we hold unto the word of God and say, yeah. Amen. You know, let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as you have. For he saith, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. I mean, we have Christians that are living in doubt when we need to be living on the promises of God. We need to look at it and say, you know what? God said it. I believe it. And that settles it. Amen. Well, God gave us the promise. We hold on to the promise. But it's so easy for us to doubt the promises of God. And then let me say, we need to fasten our grip on the service which the Lord has given us to do. 1 Timothy 1, verse 12, And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who hath enabled me for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. You know, one of the things that Satan likes doing is he likes to get people out of the ministry. And I'm not talking about just pastors and teachers. I'm talking about just laymen. You know what? We're serving God. And we come in and we serve God and, 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 and you know what? We serve him the rest of our life. But statistics show that a person usually only serves God for about three years and then that's it. I mean, our churches are filled with, uh, with uh, members. Uh, our churches are filled with people that used to, used to. You know, I used to be a teacher. I used to do this. I used to do this. 
what happened? Satan came along and, and, and took away from them the service they were doing for God. But we need people that are going to get a hold of it and say, you know what, I'm not going to quit. Another thing, we need to fasten our grip on the cross. You're called to bear. Bible says in Matthew 16, verse 24, Then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. The Bible says in Galatians 6, verse 5, For every man shall bear his own burden. You know, every Christian life has a cross. It's different for each person. You know, some people, in order to serve the Lord, it's going to cost them a lot. Some people are not going to be able to serve the Lord without pain. That's the cross they have to bear. There are sacrifices that they're going to have to make. The cross is to die on. And, and one of the things that happens is, is we come to a point in our life where our Christianity is going to cost us. Our Christianity may cost us our friends. Our Christianity may cost us our wealth. Our Christianity may cost us our health. Our Christianity may cost us our, our, our freedom. But you know what? That's the cross that we have to bear for the Lord. That's the cost that we have to pay in order to serve God. But Satan would love to have you set down your burden. Satan would love for you to set down your cross. But we need to get a hold like the three Hebrews and said, you know what? God can save us from that fiery furnace, but if not, we're not going to bow. Amen. We need to be like Daniel who purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the king's meat. I mean, understand, they, they, their, their cross may have taken their life, right. but God delivered them. And then let me say, we need to fasten our grip on one another. The Bible says, bear ye one another's burdens, so fulfill the law of Christ. Hebrews 10, verse 24, let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. You know, we're to love one another. We're to care for one another. You know, the Bible says we are not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together as a manner of some is, but exhorting one another. You know what that means? We're a body. You know, Satan is always trying to divide the body of Christ. He's always trying to come in and, and, and put a burr under somebody's saddle. He's always trying to come in and, and take away that, that hold that we have. And, and, and we see it happen so often. And it's been happening ever since uh, Jesus went back to heaven. Even when Jesus was here, there was a time when there was a dissension, several times when there was a dissension between the disciples as to who was going to be the, best, the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Mm -hmm. And we see it happen so often. I've seen it ever since I've been in the ministry. You know, I've seen times when a, a, a dear old saint of God, somebody that God was using greatly, uh, dies and goes on to heaven. And then there's a fight uh, among the brethren as to who's going to take over. I remember when John R. Rice died back in, I think it was 1980. And there was a debate, who's going to take over the sword of the Lord? And God led Curtis Hudson to take it over and he did a good job. But then Curtis Hudson ended up with cancer and dying. And then there was a battle as to who's going to take over for him. And when, when Dr. Hiles died, there was a battle. Who's going to be the next pastor of First Baptist Church? And, and, and this one was against this one and this one against this one. And, and understand, uh, you know, a house divided against itself cannot stand. Right. And one of the things that Satan can do or will do if he can is if he can create a Dis, a, a separation, a discontented people, then he can destroy a church. Mm -hmm. And we see that happen so often. So how do we end this message? What's the conclusion? Let me give you one point quickly, or a couple of points. Number one, the Christian life is a fight for right. Mm -hmm. It's a fight. Mm -hmm. I mean, we uh, hopefully not a fight against each other, but it's a fight against our flesh. It's a fight against those things that Satan's going to use to take from us what God's given us. To cause us to ease up and to slip away from where we used to be. It's a fight. And in a fight, there's going to be a battle. In a fight, there's going to be difficulties. In a fight, there's going to be victories. In a fight, there's going to be defeats. But if you get knocked down, you know what you do? You get back up. Amen. 
And if it hurts to get back up, you get up anyway. Number two, once ground is taken in life, we must fight to keep it. Once we grow, we've got to keep it. Because once we take a step forward, Satan's going to come along and try to get us to take two or three steps backward. Now let me say, Galatians 6, verse 9, we end with this, and let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Is the battle worth it? Yep. Amen. Are you going to see it right now? Not necessarily. You know, you look at it, the battle gets hard. I've not been a soldier. I've not been on the battlefield. But we have some here that have. You know, you get out there on the field, you get out in the midst of the battle and you get tired and it gets hard and people get wounded. People die on the battlefield. But you know what you do? You got to keep fighting. And you got to keep fighting. And you got to keep fighting. And every time Satan comes and takes something from us, we've got to fight and get it back. And when he comes to take something else, we stand, we get a hold of it, we hold tighter, and we don't let go. You know what? We'll never lose if we don't quit. Two things have helped me the most in the ministry. One is Dr. Hiles teaching us that quitting is not an option. It's just not an option. It's not on the table. And number two, a small church needs a pastor too. You know, I tell folks quite often, you know, somebody has to pastor Fellowship Baptist Church. If it's not me, there's got to be somebody else. But the truth is, I get the privilege. The idea of this church is important to God. You are important to God. And we need to understand that we're doing the work of God, and we are in the, in the family of God, and everything that God's given us, we've got to hold on, we've got to get a hold of, we've got to hold fast, and give it all the effort that we have. And when we're out of strength, we renew our strength by waiting on the Lord. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. So I don't know what battles you're going through tonight, today. I don't know where your Christian walk is. If you've lost something, you've lost your passion, maybe it's been taken away. Maybe you, you've just grown tired, fatigued. I don't know where you stand today, but I do know this. We need you on the battlefront. The church needs you. The Lord needs you, and the Lord's called you. And the day's going to come when, guess what? You're going to get to go to heaven. Mm -hmm. But until that day comes, you fight. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life. And so let's have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you for this evening you've given us. I thank you for this message that you led to for tonight. Uh, Lord, I pray that, Lord, you would help me to strengthen my grip. Lord, that I would hold tighter on those things that you've given us. Lord, I realize that Satan's doing everything he can to, uh, to take from us what you've given us. Lord, he knows uh, what we can do for you. He knows what you can do through us. And Lord, if he can get us distracted, if he can take from us that which you've given us, if he can take away our faith in your promises, if he can take away our hold on doctrinal truth, Lord, if he can take away the, the relationship we have with you, then, Lord, he can defeat us. And Lord, I pray that we would hold fast that which you've given to us. Strengthen our grip now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's all stand, heads bowed, eyes closed. I have no idea what God had in this message for you. I just know that God led this message. And maybe tonight is a, a time to look at what we have. And are we still holding on to the truth that God's given us? Are we still in the fight? You know, have, have we given up on the promises of God? Maybe there's a need in your life and, and, and you know, your doubt has come along and doubt has, has caused you to, to sort of give up. Maybe tonight it's time to strengthen our hold on the Lord. Whatever it is that God's spoken to your heart about, the old altar is open. Some are up here praying. You want to come and join them. Let's do business with God's word.
just fall in love with him. You love the Lord? Has God been good to you? Are you still in the fight? Sometimes I need to reassess things. Sometimes I I look and I I realize that, you know what, I've drifted a little bit. So I've got to get back into position. Got to paddle the surfboard forward and get up to where the swells are. I got to get back on the battlefront. I remember working with the brick mason and break time would come and usually we had a 15 minute break in the morning, a couple hours, 15 minute break, two more hours and then a half hour break for lunch, two more hours and a 15 minute break and then the end of the day. I remember there would be times when we'd have a 15 minute break and then it was a 20 minute, then it became a 30 minute and then somebody had to say, hey, you know what, we need to get back to work. Maybe you got on your 15 minute break, but now it's been an hour. Maybe tonight you need to get back into a relationship with the Word of God. Realizing God's given you His Word and all that's in it. And I know how easy it is to to miss and then have to start over again. But you know what? We've got to get a hold of it, what God's given us. That's a part of the Christian life. We need to get back. for the Lord. They love getting involved. But somewhere along the line, Satan has taken away what they had. Their passion's gone. Their desire's gone. They're gone. I don't want that to happen to me. realize that there's no temptation taken us but such as is common to man but I know this that God makes it possible he makes a way 